So good morning to those of you in the Americas. Good, uh, good afternoon to those of you in Europe and, and Africa. And good evening, hopefully not too late, to those of you in uh, joining us from, from Asia. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Fagan. I am the director of the Human Rights Center. And it is my pleasure to be able to, to say that we are proceeding with the, uh, our annual student organized Asia and Human Rights uh, Conference. As you all know, <laughs> the world has changed somewhat since this, uh, this conference was first scheduled to take place in, uh, in late March, I believe. We were still hoping then, but indeed I was giving reassurances to the, to the student organizing committee in mid-March that we were probably going to be able to proceed. As it turned out, that wasn't possible. Um, so we are up to 89 participants. Some of you I, I know as, as former students of ours, alumni, so welcome back to, to the Human Rights Centre, those of you who are joining us, uh, and welcome to everybody else who's, who's here to, to tune in, I hope, to what will be two fascinating days of, of, of conference and exploration of a key area of human rights concern uh, and interest um, now and, and for, for, forevermore, I'm sure. The Human Rights Centre is, is delighted that our students remain as passionate and committed as they are every year to, um, to, to giving up their time, their precious time, to organising this particular, this particular event. There are far too many of them to thank by name, um, but you know who you are and thank you so much for, for organising this event. Uh, I also have to say thank you to Sanei Fujita, um, my, my colleague and a fellow of the Human Rights Centre, long-standing fellow of the Human Rights Centre, who has been absolutely instrumental in both establishing this conference and in driving this particular event, this event forward. So Sane, thank you so much. I know you're, I hope you're there somewhere and you'll be, you'll be um, following my brief, my brief address. Um, we have today uh, Parosh, Professor Parosha Chandran and Sarah Mount speaking about areas of, of their particular work and their engagement. Really looking forward to, to hearing uh, your work and I'm looking forward, I'm sure, to the audience being able to engage and raising a huge ton load of questions that uh, my colleague from the School of Law, Matt Capes, Matthew Capes, will also be moderating and, and, and helping. So without further ado, um, welcome to the Essex Human Rights Centre, albeit in this rather strange virtual way, but we're now up to 99 participants, so I doubt that we would have reached such a, a huge number if we had to organise this physically. So thank you so much. Um, nothing more from me needs to be said, I think. I'm going to pass on, I believe, to, to my colleague Sane Fujita yes. and um, have a superb conference, everyone. Thank you so much again. Take care. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Hi, um, hello everyone. This is Sane. Um, I'm so glad to have this uh, conference finally. Um, last 12 years, I've been doing this um, conference advisor since it started. So normally we have it in, on campus and we were supposed to have it on 21st of March, but you know, at just one week difference, we had to um, make Give, 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 give up on, on face to face stuff. But we didn't want to um, cancel it because students made a lot of effort to meet, to uh, invite such a great speakers as we have today and on Thursday. Thank you so much for attending, uh, uh, attending this uh, um, meeting. And uh, I really appreciate the Human Rights Center's event team, Matt and Kat, and uh, all colleagues of Human Rights Center, in, um, especially Dr. Andrew Feda, who just spoke and uh, all the speakers today, um, Maria, Palosha, and Sarah, thank you very much for your time. And uh, especially students who made a lot of effort um, since October, we meet up every week to discuss and they had a lot of uh, work. Um, so I really appreciate your work. You did a very good job. Thank you so much. I'm very, I really enjoyed working with you. And especially this year, we have uh, many, many students who used to be in Essex so I really want to welcome you to come back. So um, because we have past work as a member of the organizing team, now this conference become an annual um, uh, event and a flagship event, Human Center is calling. So I'm so pleased to, um, uh, to have it this year in this way. So this year, since we have a lot of alumni um, coming back by virtual, I just want to reflect and I've been asked to talk about the background of this event, why this happened, why it's so important. So just four or five minutes, I want to show some photos and um, pass on to uh, Maria. I want to show this, yeah. Is it uh, working? 
Are you able to see? It? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um. Yes. Right. So, um, as you know, the Asia is a very populated region. You know, the, the inside of Saco has more population than the rest of the world. Uh, but we have a lots of humans problem, but we don't have any regional system. And uh, as you know, um, Asia is not doing very good job in humans. And uh, when you look at the stratification by CCPL, I see CL, especially uh, protocols, first and second protocol, it's not ratified very much. Even Japan, my country, hasn't ratified. <laughs> but um, although we have a lot of problem in human rights um, in Asia, but we don't have module in Essex. That's very disappointing. <laughs> so in 2009, master student who came um, from, especially from Asia, decided to have a student-led conference about Asia. So that was st started by student initiative. In 2009, uh, we talked about, um, we had a very small um, conference, half a day, uh, um, Asian value. And uh, the late Professor Kevin Boy was the um, my main person who was supporting it. And I was also working with him to support this initiative from student. And the second year we continued, we had some student panel. And the third year, uh, we had a lot of um, e um, topics we invited the Asia Human Rights, East ASEAN Human Rights Council uh, chairperson as well. Then fourth year, we continued and look at the natural disaster and human rights. And the fifth year, we looked at Myanmar. And uh, we had a, an excellent speakers from different um, area. And the fifth year, we look at the South Asia. And the seventh year, democracy and human rights. We looked at that. And the eighth year, we looked at human rights defenders and uh, lots of guests who has been at a difficult time. Then ninth year, we uh, focused on uh, gender and sexuality. And 10th year, we had anniversary and uh, we looked at the child rights. So last year, we did economic development. Then finally, this year, we look at the human rights and trafficking by virtual. So, not only today, you know, we have a second day on Thursday, so please don't miss it. Um, the, this is a bit of advertisement related to this topic. This, when uh, last March, this new special operator on contemporary form of slavery was appointed, but he is also from Essex. He is Essex um, uh, Mafia as well, and he wanted to come to join us today, but he has a lot of work to do, so he just gave us good luck. But hopefully we want to, we want to have him sometime um, speak a series or something. And all this uh, Human Rights in Asia conference uh, uh, final report is available on this website. So please have a look. And this year's report will be um, added in near future. So please enjoy and uh, don't miss uh, Thursday as well. Thank you. So I want to, yeah, finish. So, so it's uh, hand over to Mar Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, well, hello everyone and thank you for taking time to join us today discussing the issues surrounding human trafficking in Asia. I have a great honor to introduce our two speakers for today that Andrew already mentioned, Professor Parosha Chandran, a human rights barrister based at One Pump Court Chamber in London, and a professor of practice in modern slavery law at King's College London, and Ms. Sarah Mount, uh, a senior project management at the Freedom Fund. They will be speaking for 15 to 20 minutes each, followed by a 30 minutes Q&A session. Um, you may ask your questions using the chat box and I will read these questions to the speakers after they finish with their respective presentations. Um, our keynote speaker today, as I mentioned, is Professor Parosha Chandran. She's a world leading expert on the law relating to human trafficking with over 23 years of practice at the bar during which she has set numerous legal trafficking precedents through her court cases and advisory work, including in the criminal, non-punishment, civil, asylum, slavery, and public law fields. She has received many honors for her work, including the Barrister of the Year Award in 2008 from the Law Society of England and Wales, and the Trafficking in Persons Hero Award 2015 from the then US Secretary of State John Kerry, when she was marked out by the Obama administration for unparalleled achievements in providing legal services to survivors of modern slavery. Parosha has helped shape key international guidance on trafficking, 
developed by the UNODC, OSCE, and the Council of Europe, and has given training on human trafficking for judges and public prosecutors, as well as training for Commonwealth parliamentarians on behalf of the British Parliament. He has advised on the domestic laws of numerous cases. So we are absolutely grateful for her. She has joined us today to share her immense knowledge and experience in addressing human trafficking and modesty. And without further ado, over to you, Parosha. Thank you, uh, Maria. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of those who organized this conference, in particular, Alana and Emila, uh, as well as to Andrew, of course, and Sanai, for a warm welcome, and Matthew, too. And, and of course, greetings to my fellow panelists, Sarah Mount. Um, looking forward to learning from you. Um, I just want to say something very briefly about Essex, um, because I fell into the world of human rights um, in 1993 when I was studying my law and I went to the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg that was founded by René Cassin when he won the Nobel Peace Prize with Eleanor Roosevelt for drafting the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And it was there for the first time that I met uh, colleagues from the University of Essex. Um, some years later, I joined the Kurdish Human Rights Project as a uh, lawyer and was able to bring take cases to the European Court of Human Rights um, in respect of um, individuals uh, under Articles 2 and 3. And it was the work of Essex that had established so much uh, the positive obligations under human rights law that arise under Articles 2 and 3. Um, and I, which I later um, was able to use uh, in my cases uh, in England um, under Article 4, when in 2008 I brought the first case against the police, the Metropolitan Police, for failing to investigate a trafficking case and argued um, the similar vein of uh, presentation submissions under Articles 2 and 3, but this time under Article 4, failure to investigate. Uh, human trafficking as a form of uh, precondition to slavery, servitude and forced labour. So um, a big thumbs up to Essex for everything uh, that it's done and its real world leading um, reputation and being such a force in the world um, to promote the rights of, of victims of, traf of human rights abuses. So um, it's with that background that I then fell into this area of um, human trafficking as uh, an area of law that I wanted to develop in 2003. Um, so the first area I've been uh, invited to talk to you about are my cases that re relating to the Vietnamese children. Um, in around uh, 2005, 2006, I learned about the plight of Vietnamese children who'd been trafficked from Vietnam over to England and were being used for cannabis cultivation. The cases would come to me when NGOs would tell me that they had um, noticed that there was a child who had been convicted of cannabis cultivation who was serving a sentence and was there something I could do about it and started looking into the cases but it, before I could actually bring a case uh, each time the short custodials part of the uh, sentence um, had been served and the child was then re-trafficked because as soon as they were released from uh, the custody part of the sentence um, they would go back to the hands of the trafficker because that's what they had been told they had to do. So it wasn't until um, some years later that I was able to bring the cases I wanted to bring which was um, actually uh, yeah which was in 2012. So by that time, um, uh, I represented a, a young boy who had been trafficked. Um, he'd been sent to the UK um, by his parents um, and he was then taken a, 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 day, a day later into a, uh, by a person who put him in a cannabis factory a few days later. Um, the windows were bricked in from the outside, the doors were bolted. Um, and uh, he was forced to cultivate cannabis. When he was discovered, they, the police found that the yield was up to a half million pounds worth of cannabis, and yet he was arrested, prosecuted, convicted, and put in prison uh, for the punishment 
of having done what he was required to do by the organised criminal network. Um, I unsuccessfully brought that case to criminal appeal in 2012 and so I lodged it in Strasbourg um, arguing the non-punishment provision which is the freedom from liability for an unlawful act that a child does um, that's related to or is a, a direct consequence of their trafficking. Um, and that case is still pending before the European Court of Human Rights eight years later and we're hoping to reach a Find, hear about a judgment later on this uh, year. In the meantime, I, I was not taking no for an answer, so I brought another case the following year in 2013, which was successful. And the Court of Appeal accepted that regardless of the form of exploitation, um, the case of a child should be looked at very carefully. Um, and it should be um, a case where culpability would be diminished, if not effectively extinguished if the child committed the offence under the dominant force of the trafficker. So that case, Ellen others, really changed law and policy in the UK and had great ripples outside um, across the pond um, to um, other countries and continents. This, um, these cases were relevant because what they did is to make real why the application of the non-punishment provision was necessary and why it shouldn't be a discretion for prosecutors but needed to really have a legal provision that could protect all traffic victims from being so punished whether or not the exploitation um, was one that did not engage a criminal act or whether it did because we have to be reminded that the person that chooses the exploitation is the trafficker. Um, and there should be no discrimination in respect of the protection of victims. So we'll see what happens with that case. But in the meantime, what we have seen is developments. In 2014, of course, the ILO Forced Labour Convention Protocol um, included a non-punishment provision. The first binding provision on non-punishment is to be found in the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, Article 26, and the same wording was adopted by the ILO. Uh, we also have the EU Directive on Trafficking of 2011, which entered into force in 2013, and that includes very clear wording. It's called non-prosecution and non-punishment, so there can never be a quibble over whether or not it's about sentence or it's about liability. It's about liability um, and protection of, from liability for doing any unlawful act uh, that arises as a direct consequence, or in the case of children, related to the trafficking. Um, we've also got this in the ASEAN Convention, and so that's very important as well. And actually, the wording of it is very extensive. It falls under uh, Article 14 of the ASEAN Convention, which is called the Protection of Victims of Trafficking in Persons, and Article 7. 14.7 um, says that each party shall subject to its domestic laws, rules, regulations and policies and in appropriate cases it says here, which I would strike out, it applies in all cases, consider not holding victims of trafficking in persons criminally or administratively liable for unlawful acts, acts committed by them if such acts are directly related to the acts of trafficking. And part 8 of article 14 is also relevant and it talks about um, that where a victim of trafficking has been identified as being a victim, they should not be held in detention or prison prior, during or after civil, criminal or administrative proceedings for trafficking in person. So that's important to note. So I wanted to just start with that, which is that I've actually dealt with cases that have involved victims traffic from the Asia region into Britain. Um, the next area uh, I'd like to talk about is some work that I've been doing recently for um, LUMOS. LUMOS is the Children's Foundation of J.K. Rowling. Now, they approached me a year ago to look at something called orphanage trafficking and to determine a legal response to it. Orphanage trafficking isn't what you'd immediately think uh, it's about namely the trafficking of children from orphanages outside for any form of exploitation. Orphanage trafficking has been termed by the brilliant lawyer Kate Van Dorr from Australia uh, as being the um, uh, 
the, the use of children, whether they're orphans or not, but the presentation of children uh, as orphans, uh, into uh, orphanages, where, which are set up by organized criminal networks or, or anyone wanting to profit from the pretense that it is an orphanage. Now, because under Palermo, which many countries in the Asia region have ratified, um, includes that list of exploitation, which we know is only a starting point and not an end point, most countries have focused on um, trafficking for sexual exploitation, forced labor, slavery, servitude, removal of organs, uh, incorporating them into their domestic law. But when it comes to a new form of exploitation, countries don't have an immediate legal response to it unless there's an amendment of the laws. So even when it came to trafficking for criminal activities, such as in those Vietnamese cases I'm talking about, when I brought that first case in 2012, the EU directive hadn't entered into force into England. And so the concept of uh, using a child for criminal activities was something that there was a lot of tension against and a lot of resistance to. But those words were actually included in the EU directive um, as a form of exploitation. So it became a bit easier to swallow uh, for the EU um, countries, including Britain to accept identification of that type of traffic victim as being a victim and therefore being entitled to non-punishment. So then when you come to these children who are used in the orphanages, there's nothing to do with non-punishment to do with it, but it's the extension of understanding. Unless you've got a law against trafficking that actually incorporates the use of a child by, uh, um, by a, a person or by a, 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 an orphanage, a business uh, as um, a form of financial profit, then that act, action is not yet criminalised. So I was asked to draft a model law on this, and that's what I've been doing. I'm finalising it this week for Lumos with the idea that they would like to focus on this and, and to present a potential um, model law um, answer. To, to this problem. Uh, and so that's very important. Now you might think, well, I don't know anything about these orphanages being set up. Well, Google it. If you Google orphanage trafficking, you'll find a lot of it and you'll find a lot of it in the Asia region. So for example, um, the direct evidence that has been obtained by NGOs shows that, for example, when there, were the, there was the earthquake in Nepal and there was so much devastation, and particularly in Kathmandu, that area was then um, uh, an area where the world's um, humanitarian responses and funding was being directed through different um, humanitarian uh, agencies and interests from the world. And suddenly, overnight, there was an increase of 85% of orphanages in Kathmandu, not because there was an increase of that uh, the uh, proportion of children who were orphans, but criminals realized that if they set up an orphanage in Kathmandu, they could pretend that they were helping children and they could acquire criminal profits for themselves. And so what we've been finding is that children who are not orphans are being taken into orphanages with pretense to poor families that they'll get education or shelter or good clothing, good housing, but in fact they're malnourished, they're not treated properly, they're denied and deprived of every right under the Convention of the Rights of the Child, um, and there's just a proliferation of these orphanages and the burgeoning of profits because there's no legal response to criminalising the conduct. So that's something that um, I've been looking at that relates to the Asia region. Um, another uh, aspect I'd like to just talk about briefly, um, can you just tell me how many more minutes I have, please, Maria? We have about maybe 10 minutes more. Okay. Thank Nine, you. to be specific. Eight, seven. Okay, so um, uh, 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 the next area I wanted to talk about briefly was the case of um, two, two areas, really. One is corporate criminal liability and the other is migrant workers. So um, one, of, one of the uh, other areas that I've been working in is for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association UK, which is the British Parliament's um, modern slavery project, 
It was set up in 2017 to assist Commonwealth states in their responses to trafficking and modern slavery. Uh, and so it funds uh, assistance, uh, expert assistance to any Commonwealth state that would like to have help um, to adjust, amend, improve its response to combating these kinds of crimes. So I was appointed um, as um, a legal advisor, which was kind of uh, interesting for me because I've been bringing cases against the state for, for all of my career and I haven't stopped my cases in Strasbourg at the moment against the British government on non-punishment, uh, that case that I lost in 2012. Um, but British Parliament came and said that uh, they appreciated my expertise and, and so would I um, be the, the legal advisor and then senior legal advisor uh, is what I became. So in this um, aspect, I have met parliamentarians from the Asia region, the Africa region, the Pacific region. And one thing that has become very clear is a continuing harm that is affecting the Asia region very dramatically, just as much as Africa, is the recruitment by labor recruitment agencies of individuals who think they've got a legitimate job that's going to be given to them, usually in the Middle East, and they go and they don't come back because they are enslaved there. They have the passports taken away. It's not a simple case of Kafala, it's far worse than that because they go with a legitimate feeling that they're going to be given a legitimate job. And suddenly someone who may even be a graduate is enslaved there and kept there without any rights and without any opportunity to return. Their parents may have paid money to that labour recruitment agency to take them and so the child, whether they're in their 20s or 30s, may feel that they can't tell their parents or family what's happened to them, a number of reasons why uh, what may, it may not come to light for some time. And so one thing the world has been struggling with is where do we go with this? Well, my world of, of trafficking and modern slavery is I've been struggling with, and I, Sarah's nodding as well, clearly the Freedom Front has, you know, where do we go with this? What, what can we do? Because m my role has always been to agitate and to, 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 to see the gaps, to try to fill them, to ask for reform and to influence reform. And so what can we do in this? Does the Palermo Protocol as a starting point, for example, say anything about corporate criminal liability? Now, when the model law, the UN model law of 2009 was drafted, um, and I, uh, I, I had no role in that, and, and it's brilliant. Um, it, what I uh, recently, a couple of years ago, I was asked by the UNODC if I would look at the model law of 2009 with a view to suggesting some recommendations for updating it. And one of the things that I noticed was that it didn't include anything on corporate liability. Um, and so I looked into that further. And when I did so, I found that actually it was, it had just been, um, overlooked. But actually, if you look at the parent um, convention, which is the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, it provides for the legal liability of, of persons, legal persons, as opposed to natural persons, or in addition to national natural persons. And so I had recommended that the, revi the revised UN model law on trafficking um, against persons includes uh, legal liability, liability for legal persons, that is corporations, businesses, etc., who are engaged in human trafficking. That's one side of it, human trafficking, but modern slavery is the other side of it. And in Britain, as uh, you may or may not know, because I know we have a diverse um, audience today, um, we didn't actually have a freestanding um, criminal law against holding a person in slavery or servitude or requiring someone to perform forced labour until 2009. We'd abolish the transatlantic slave trade a couple of hundred years ago, which is now of course coming under increasing scrutiny as to really what that was all about. Um, 
But one of my cases in 2008 um, opened the Pandora's box on this massive legislation gap. And, and so that freestanding offence of slavery, servitude, forced labour came in in 2009 into British law as a direct result of my case and is now section one of our modern slavery act. Section two is human trafficking. So my proposals are for the Commonwealth states that ask me to advise and any state that would ask me or anyone who would ask me to advise what do we need to have a very robust framework to combat modern slavery is of course the preliminary protocol is critical. That's the parent uh, mothership when it comes to modern um, response to these spectres. But in addition to that, we need freestanding offences of slavery, servitude and forced labour. Because when the police force comes upon a situation, if they can see a person being held in slavery, servitude or forced labour, they can then charge that person with that straight away. And then if they can look and see who recruited, who received, who harboured, who transferred, who transported, then let's get the whole chain in as well. So it just assists, it's complementary. Then what if we can also get corporate criminal liability? So not only are we prosecuting the natural persons, which is of course there under um, Palermo, under the Council of Europe Convention, under EU direction, under ASEAN, under the Forced Labour Protocol of 2014, etc., um, and under so many domestic laws in Asia. But what we don't often have is corporate criminal liability in addition, which would engage very significant responses because you could um, enable the bringing to its knees of a business that has engaged in slavery, servitude, forced labour, human trafficking. And that would be a massive deterrent because it would hit in the pocket those who prosper. And that is what I would like to see. I've been advising um, luminary um, members of parliament from Uganda on their anti-slavery bill 2020. It is about to be placed before their parliament, so I understand tomorrow in Kampala for first reading. Without saying much more, let's see what's in there. Thank you very much. Look forward to hearing from Sarah. Thank you so much, Barosha. This was amazing. Uh, start of this event and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. I sure do have a few, uh, but uh, I would like to move on to our next speaker, Ms. Sarah Mount, um, and then we can uh, open the Q&A. Sarah is a senior program management at the Freedom Fund, where she's leading the Freedom Fund's work to address human trafficking and forced labor in the seafood industry in Asia. Sarah has over 12 years experience in human rights and legal project management in Asia, Africa and Australia. Throughout her career, Sarah has worked in partnership with local civil society on numerous projects to address forced labor and promote safe migration in the construction, agricultural, apparel, seafood and domestic work industries. Uh, before coming to the UK, Sarah lived and worked in India and Australia. She's a qualified Australian solicitor and holds a bachelor's degree in law and arts from Monash University, Australia, as well as a master's in public law and international law from the University of Melbourne. She will talk today about a range of laws that can be used to address modern slavery and human trafficking, both internationally and domestically, and different approaches that each of these legal contexts require. Um, in doing so, she will draw some practical examples from her extensive practice. Um, over to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you, um, Maria, for that introduction. And thank you, Andrew and Sane, as well, for your introduction and warm words of welcome. And uh, thank you to the students of the University of Essex um, Human Rights Centre for organising this uh, amazing conference and for inviting me to speak. It's a real pleasure to be here and to share my experiences with you. Um, and finally, thank you to Parosha as well. I've been uh, following your work for a long period of time and really inspired by it. Um, you've been um, really pushing forward some brilliant precedents in the area. And um, I wish you all the best with the corporate liability uh, work that you're doing. That would be really amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to share my screen here. Is that working? Am I sharing my screen? Yes. Oops, sorry. So I'm just trying to 
um, put on a slideshow. Sorry, my mouse has been a bit um, uh, not working very well. So I am, um, yeah, as introduced by Maria, I'm a senior program manager at the Freedom Fund. So the Freedom Fund is an organization that is working to eliminate modern slavery. Um, so modern slavery was touched on by Parisha in her presentation. And it's really, I guess, at the international level, it's an umbrella term, which is broadly used to cover all forms of slavery, servitude and unfree labor in the world today. So that can include human trafficking, uh, forced labor, the worst forms of child labor, domestic servitude, organ trafficking. And as time goes on, sometimes new forms of, um, of servitude or slavery like practices are included to the list. And recently um, child marriage was also sort of recognized as falling, as potentially falling under the umbrella term of modern slavery as well. So hopefully there's the opportunity in future Parisha to also include um, trafficking in relation to orphanages, because um, that sounds like it, it, it should fall under this area as well. Um, so I was asked today to speak about human trafficking in Asia, which is obviously um, what the conference is about, um, but I will talk a little bit more broadly about um, modern slavery in Asia. So as Parisha mentioned, uh, human trafficking for forced labor is is quite common and human trafficking for other things like um, uh, forced sex work as well, but also uh, forced labor and bonded labor can also exist as a standalone offense and are not necessarily always linked to human trafficking. So I'll sort of talk about the broad spectrum of, of work there. Um, and because there are a broad range of speakers uh, talking uh, tomorrow, I think about particular um, situations of trafficking and modern slavery in Asia. I thought I would try and talk broadly about the diversity in approaches and laws uh, that we take in our work at Freedom Fund and that can be used to address um, modern slavery. I'll just move on to the next slide there. So first I'll start by just explaining who Freedom Fund are. So we work to um, address modern slavery throughout the world. Um, we're an international NGO. Um, our approach is to work in geographical hotspots um, around the world where we focus our resources and efforts in areas where we think there is a significant problem of modern slavery and where we think we can also create a tipping point um, to really create change and address that form of modern slavery in that area. So basically we try and assess where there's a big need in a particular country or a particular area. And then also where we think um, we have the potential to create change to address that um, challenge um, over you know, a five or 10 year period. We work both with uh, local civil society and communities on the ground in the countries affected. And really that's the primary way that we work with partners on the ground in a, in a bottom up approach. But we also work with international uh, NGOs and consultants as well to push uh, international governments and others to take change as well. And you'll see from the map here on the screen um, that we have projects in Thailand, Myanmar, India, Nepal, Ethiopia and Brazil. Um, but it's a little bit deceptive. So even though we only operate in six countries, we actually have nine projects. And that's because we have three projects in India and two in Nepal. Um, so I'll just go into a little bit of detail about which, what each project in Asia focuses on so you can have an idea of um, the kind of range of, of work um, relating to modern slavery in Asia that we work on. So uh, one of the projects in India uh, focuses on addressing um, human trafficking and bonded labour in the North Indian states of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. We have another project in the West Indian state of Rajasthan, which is working to address the worst forms of child labor and child trafficking, uh, particularly in the bangal and bag making industries. And then we have a third project in the Southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu, which is trying to address uh, bonded labor and also trafficking into bonded labor of teenage girls in the cotton spinning mills in um, Tamil Nadu. So those cotton spinning mills uh, produce cotton, which then goes onto another factory, which is which produce uh, clothing like shirts and t-shirts, which is then sold um, to uh, international markets and 
and a part of the clothes that some of us might be wearing today. Um, we then have uh, two projects in Nepal. So we have one focused on agricultural bonded labor of the Harua Charua people in the Southern Terai region of Nepal. And one focused on trying to address um, the um, commercial sexual exploitation of children and trafficking of children into the adult entertainment sector in Kathmandu. Um, in Myanmar, we have one project which is focused on trying to um, address uh, potential human trafficking um, of women and girls into China for forced marriage and child rearing. Um, and then in Thailand, it's the project that I work on actually, uh, we have a project uh, to address human trafficking and forced labour of migrant workers from Myanmar and Cambodia into the seafood and fishing industries in Thailand. So there are our um, projects in Asia, just to give you a bit of a feel of the variety there of different things that you can work on under modern slavery. Um, and then in addition to um, projects in particular geographic areas. We also have what we call global initiatives, uh, which is where we grant to promising initiatives that can um, be located in any region of the world, um, but that we think might help catalyze change or set a precedent that could be used in other areas of, of the, the world. For example, a corporate liability clause would be, you know, a great one to fund that might be useful in other areas of the world as well and would set a great precedent. So normally they fall under four areas, which is safer migration, uh, strategic litigation, um, supply chains and mental health. Um, so as you can see, there are a broad range of areas covered by modern slavery. Um, and it often involves human trafficking um, or human trafficking into forced labor or other types of unfree labor um, as well. So in addition to having a range of areas that a project might focus on under modern slavery, um, there are also diverse approaches that can be taken when trying to address um, forms of modern slavery. So I'll run through a range of the approaches that we use at Freedom Fund, just to give you a bit of a flavour of, of the types of approaches that, that can be used. So the first one I've mentioned here, which you'll see on the screen, is um, a sectoral approach, um, which is where, you know, we're attempting to ensure decent work within a sector or an industry. So that is the approach we've taken in Thailand and also South India, where we're trying to really reform the industry, the seafood and fishing industry in Thailand, and then in, in southern India, the cotton spinning mill industry to ensure there's decent work and thereby uh, eliminate any human trafficking or forced labour, hopefully, into that sector, but also prevent future um, forms of exploitation, labour exploitation as well. Another approach that we sometimes take is one that's focused particularly on a geography. So where we try and address all forms of modern slavery and improve sort of community resilience um, and conditions more broadly um, in particular areas. And that's the approach we've taken in our project in North India, where we're trying to address um, bonded labor and human trafficking more broadly in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. Um, and so we work there in, a high number of villages in a number of districts across those two states. And that project has been uh, actually evaluated by the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex over a number of years. And it's actually found that it's been very successful in reducing the uh, prevalence of bonded labor. And that's really, the project really tries there to improve community resilience um, and different methods uh, used at the community level to try and, and fight uh, bonded labour and improve uh, communities' situations as a whole. The other approach that we sometimes take is a prevention approach, where we work with communities um, and, and people before they migrate for work um, or migrate for a particular reason to try and inform them about their rights, their options, um, and how to try and avoid a potential situation of human trafficking or forced labor in the future. So we undertake that approach in our Myanmar project where we're working with communities um, where women and girls may migrate to China for marriage um, to try and inform them of, of different 
of their rights and different information so that they can um, avoid falling into a situation where they might be trafficked uh, for forced marriage as opposed to voluntarily migrating for marriage um, instead. We also follow the same approach in Ethiopia, which is outside of Asia, so I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's a project uh, where we work with women and girls who migrate to the Middle East, primarily Saudi Arabia, for domestic work. Um, so we also follow the same approach. And we follow this approach largely because it's really difficult to work in China and difficult to work in the Middle East um, on these issues, um, particularly a lot of the Ethiopian and women and girls, the vast majority are going to Saudi Arabia, which is even more difficult to work. So we, we try and work in the country of origin before they leave. So there are a couple of approaches um, that, that are taken in different cases, trying to address modern slavery and human trafficking. We also, I also thought I'd touch on a couple of cross-cutting models that people use in uh, projects to address uh, modern slavery and human trafficking. So some organisations focus uh, primarily on what I'd say is a justice model, which is trying to um, identify perpetrators, uh, prosecute under various laws and um, achieve a conviction or punishment, and then obviously obtain access to justice for the victims or the people affected um, in that particular case. Another approach, I guess, is a broader labour approach where it's trying to um, obtain decent working conditions um, across an industry or across a particular area and safer migration as a whole. And then the third sort of model is um, a development model, which is a bit more holistic and looking at trying to address root causes which may cause human trafficking and forced labour, modern slavery in general, so precarious labour conditions or um, things like that in general, rather than addressing forced labour and human trafficking once it arises, trying to sort of address some of those underlying um, larger problems that, that prompt these um, issues in the first place. Um, I'd say at Freedom Fund that we work on all three of those cross-cutting models and to various degrees, depending on the, on the project. Um, we do um, incorporate the justice approach in most of our work, um, but we never just focus primarily on that um, because it is, um, uh, you know, it does it, addressing sort of um, individual cases without looking at the broader system um, is difficult to sort of create change across the whole. And um, in many of the countries where we work, the justice system is, is difficult to work with, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't proceed, but it's, it's difficult to work with if that's your only model. Um, it also is difficult for um, people affected to go through the justice system sometimes. Um, they're often, once they're identified and someone is charged, they may be placed in a shelter. Um, where they're unable to leave, they may be separated from their family and communication um, is limited. Um, and they, these cases often go on for a long time, for, for years in certain situations. And so they're basic, in some situations, they're, they're in a shelter for a long period of time without having, um, with, you know, unable to sort of proceed with their life. Um, so, I mean, we do, we do definitely try and uh, use the justice model in our work, but it's not the only model that we would focus on because of, of, of those issues there. Um, but it is obviously important to create a deterrent effect and it's, it's also important definitely to pursue strategic litigation as well in our cases, in our uh, projects. Um, so I know this is a conference for uh, law students, obviously. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about the international and domestic legal mechanisms that we also use in our project. Um, so we obviously use international laws and mechanisms. Um, so we use the ILO conventions, the UN conventions and protocols, um, and the various different um, special mechanisms and procedures at the international level. And then I'll give you some examples from our Thailand project to put it into context. So the picture there um, on the screen at the top is uh, Myanmar, a migrant worker from Myanmar who was um, a fishing um, worker um, in Thailand that um, 
did receive help through some of our partners. So I just put that picture there as a, a reminder that I guess when we're using all these mechanisms, it is about obviously helping people at the end of it and trying to assist them in obtaining, you know, the opportunities and work that they wanted to achieve in, in the best situation they can um, going forward. So in Thailand, um, in our project to address forced labor and human trafficking in the seafood and fishing sector and, and create decent work in that sector, we've been lobbying and advocating quite hard for the Thai government to ratify um, the protocol to the ILO uh, Convention Against Forced Labor, and then also the ILO Convention on Work and Fishing, which would mean once they ratify in Thailand, they are required to implement the international law into domestic law. So it's quite useful when they do ratify conventions. They have ratified both of those after significant pressure in Thailand. So that was a real uh, win for our partners, um, advocacy win there. But they haven't ratified two other ILO conventions we've been pushing for, which is on um, collective bargaining and freedom of association. Um, and these are really important because the migrant workers that work in the sector that make up the whole workforce in this sector are unable in Thailand to uh, lead or form their own unions, which mean that they really struggle to um, have any power in the workplace to negotiate their own conditions. So it's important, important uh, conventions for Thailand to ratify, but we haven't been successful there yet. We also have used... Um, UN conventions and committees under conventions when they're relevant. So again, in Thailand, they're up for review by the con under the committee to, for the convention to eliminate racial discrimination. And our partners are submitting a shadow report um, to that mechanism so that we can highlight the discrimination that migrant workers in our sector do face and particularly discrimination that they've faced um, recently in relation to the pandemic and inability to access government uh, support mechanisms. So we also use mechanisms like that when they come up. We also are making a um, submission to the Universal Periodic Review of Thailand um, and we'll be then lobbying particular country governments to make recommendations to Thailand next year. And then we also sometimes submit um, and uh, talk to UN special uh, procedures uh, like the special rapporteurs, the relevant different special rapporteurs when relevant for our country. Um, then domestic laws are obviously really relevant in each of our projects that we do on the ground in Asia. And I wanted to give an example here from India. Um, and so the picture at the bottom is um, workers um, in India learning about some of the labor laws that they could use within their particular um, sector and, and so that they know their rights. But I wanted to point out that there really are a huge range of laws that are relevant um, when working on modern slavery and, and India is a really good example. There's a specific anti-human trafficking law, um, there's an anti-bonded labor law. Um, uh, once someone is um, I guess, assisted to be removed from a situation of bonded labor or human trafficking. They often haven't had their wages received. So labor laws are really relevant. So people can access their unpaid wages. Recruitment laws like Parish was talking about uh, before and particularly um, regulating recruitment agencies are really important. And in India, that's particularly important for domestic workers where they're often trafficked via informal recruitment agencies. Um, in India, there's an Interstate Migration uh, Act, which is meant to regulate the movement of workers, migration of workers between states, uh, which is important. Um, there is obviously the criminal law as well, which actually outlaws a lot of these, you know, human trafficking and forced labor as well. Proceeds of Crime Act, um, there's the constitution, which is also um, of use, and there's there's specific acts for specific sectors, like the Factories Act, or if someone is a is a contractual worker. There's a contract labor law act as well. So I just wanted to point out that there's a really diverse range of laws that can be used in this sector um, as well and, and drawn from. Um, then finally, I wanted to point out about um, the projects that we work on in, in global supply chain. So our project in Thailand is a global supply chain project. The seafood that is caught and processed in Thailand is sold to Tesco's and Sainsbury's and um, 
you know, Costco and Walmart. Um, so US, UK, EU, Australia, Canada, um, all around the world. Um, and so, of course, in global supply chains, it's not just the country that are exporting um, the product. So the seafood and fish um, where they have to change. I mean, obviously, that country, Thailand, has to change its laws and regulate um, so that there's no human trafficking or forced labor. But it's also the companies that are importing the goods um, that, are, that um, are often based, like I said, in the UK or the uh, EU, the US, the global north, that also have to be closely regulated by the law. Um, these companies have a lot of power in the marketplace and they seek prices um, in other countries deliberately to make a profit, um, as I'm sure we're all aware. And they outsource to ensure they have li limited legal responsibility for working conditions, human rights and environmental standards. And in many countries, these corporations are really exacerbating um, human rights and labour um, rights issues, um, they're really exacerbating bad conditions um, because they're pushing and pushing for, for really uh, cheaper and cheaper prices. Um, and they have a lot of power. And so governments in countries where they're headquartered really must regulate them. So I wanted to point out some of the laws that we have at the moment uh, to regulate them and that, that hopefully will come about to regulate corporations. So there's transparency laws like the sections of the UK Modern Slavery Act, which require corporations to at least report on, um, you know, what they're doing to address risk of modern slavery in their supply chain, even though there's no penalties or, or really sanctions for that, at least it's there in the law. There are some sort of human rights due diligence laws in countries in Europe, and there is likely going to be a European level mandatory human rights due diligence law, which will require corporations in Europe to um, really map their supply chains to undertake human rights, uh, comprehensive human rights checks throughout their supply chain to check that they're being compliant. And hopefully it will have penalties in place if they are not doing this and if there are problems um, that are, arise later. Um, hopefully corporate liability like Purusha was talking about before. And then there's also, I guess, company and corporations law, which I know certain actors are looking into how we can use that to, to really um, push for better approaches um, by companies in global supply chains. Now, finally, I just wanted to touch on regional frameworks um, because um, I was asked to talk a little bit about regional frameworks in Asia. Um, we don't use them that much in our project, although there, there is ASEAN, as Purusha was mentioning earlier, and there is uh, SARC, of course, as well. So um, Asian do have a convention, and actually Purusha was limit, um, talking about some of the articles in that convention which are relevant. Um, so uh, I think it is something that we should look into using a bit more. Traditionally, it's been a bit hard for NGOs on the ground to engage much in ASEAN, um, but it is an avenue that we could push you further. There's also the Bali process on uh, people smuggling, trafficking in persons and related transnational crime. Um, again, it's not a forum that we have used a lot because it takes quite a criminal justice sort of approach uh, to these issues within countries. Um, but there is a, a business and government forum underneath um, that larger Bali process, which is quite useful, which we've engaged with a bit, which where business and government get together to talk about common issues. And it started to shift from talking about um, I guess sometimes mi migration in a criminal sort of way or trying to stop stop you know smuggling and trafficking to more talking about how to facilitate safer migration which I think is really important as well because migration has always happened and it always will and and I guess it's important to facilitate it safely without trafficking being involved. Um, and then at the regional level, there's also some international labour organisation and international um, organisation for migration projects as well that we sometimes work with as well. And so I think I'm probably at the 20 minute mark, so I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. This was really fantastic and a lot of thoughts. Um, I have a few questions. I would like to invite um, the attendees to ask questions. I've collected a few that they asked and I would perhaps like to add one or two myself. So the first question asked um, 
Dr. Frigita mentioned the lack of regional human rights mechanism code for the Asia Pacific. I wonder what the panelists think about Asia having not or not having such mechanisms. And perhaps I could add that what's quite interesting is that the ASEAN Anti Trafficking Convention is one of, it's quite an anomaly for ASEAN. Uh, it's one of the very few hard law instruments legally binding. Uh, as opposed to, for example, ASEAN Declaration on Human Rights. So I wonder what your opinion is in that context on the merit and strength of that instrument to induce change. Um, do you like to maybe reflect this before to the next question, or you would like to take the question uh, first? Maybe give us a few questions, and then we can... Uh... Okay. Uh, the second was, Pernosha, um, with your work, uh, how important is public awareness and support to pushing forward the creation and adoption of new laws, particularly on child trafficking to orphanages? As I know, voluntarism trips to orphanages have uh, become increasingly popular. Um, I also wanted to ask Sarah specifically because she mentioned that the justice model is tricky and lengthy. And I was just wondering, um, you know, uh, about some further risks that have especially transpired in Thailand in the context of global food chains. And I'm sure you will be aware of these natural fruit cases and Tamaksak um, poultry factories where human rights defenders and people who were representing victims have been then subject to multiple defamation charges and have been actually forced out of the country. So I wonder to what extent that kind of risk uh, plays a role in your strategy. Um, of course, uh, question, people have asked, uh, has, how has COVID-19 has exacerbated the vulnerabilities of victims of human trafficking? Also, how is it anticipated to impact or shift the way organizations deal with this issue alongside travel bans and restrictions? Um, a question for Sarah. Could you explain the lobbying process involved in Universal Periodic Review? Um, we have another one. Um, would either of you be happy to talk a bit more about how to address the issue of criminalization of the victims of trafficking and their re-victimization? by the criminal justice system within Asia, particularly with migrant workers or sex workers who may be in conflict with law. And we have another one. Can you explain if strategic litigation is the best tool to address the issue at hand? What is the pro and cons of using trafficking? Uh, Maria, we can't hear you so well with this last one. You are cutting out on us. Hello? You're cutting out. The, the earlier questions we had, so maybe we should deal with the ones that you've asked us already. Yes, good idea. Sarah, would you like to go first with any? Um. I can start with the ASEAN question and then pass it to you, Parusha, because I think you've done some work in, in ASEAN. Um, like I said at the end of my um, presentation, we actually haven't used ASEAN very much, but I, I, I recognise your question, Maria, um, like that they do have a hard law instrument in relation to trafficking, but the human rights general instruments are a sort of soft law. I mean, particularly compared to other regional bodies around the world. Um, I don't think they have the most effective mechanisms in the human rights sector. So obviously there's Europe and there's other uh, regional bodies in uh, Africa which have stronger mechanisms. And, um, but ASEAN has traditionally been quite weak and I think that's why we haven't really engaged with them. And to be honest, we haven't actually used the ASEAN convention, um, that hard law convention, a lot of the time we're working on within our Asia projects on cases internal to a country, um, except so like in, a, in India, it's all internal, even though they're going between states. And then in, in Nepal, it's internal as well. The only countries that are sort of external going across borders is um, 
is the Thailand project and the Myanmar project. Myanmar with China is obviously difficult to work with through ASEAN, but then you have Thailand. Um, so we are trying to look into regional mechanisms because fishing and seafood in particular and the movement of workers between different countries in ASEAN uh, happens all the time for fishing, um, particularly Indonesia, Vietnamese, Filipino workers to Taiwan and, um, you know, people going all throughout Myanmar and Cambodia to Thailand. But we actually haven't really used the convention. Um, we've been using other mechanisms like talking about migration pathways through memorandum of understanding between different countries rather than use um, the actual convention. We had heard from different people in the region that ASEAN is, is, hasn't been that effective to use and so that's why we'd sort of not been uh, following up on it as much but I'd like to hear Parusha's views on the convention because I think she'd have more informed uh, information than me. Well, thank you. I mean, to be honest, I haven't worked uh, on the uh, ASEAN Convention other than looking at it from the scope of non-punishment in particular. Um, so uh, it might be better that somebody uh, much more um, specialist than me uh, is able to give a, a legal overview of its um, territoriality and its effectiveness, its enforcement, uh, if anything. Um, but what I would like to say is that in cases that I've looked at in the past, I have struggled uh, with advising on um, robust outcomes uh, for Asia, where because of a lack of a judicial uh, enforcement system that is regional. So whereas, for example, we have the benefit in Britain of being under the supervisory jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, which has been able to interpret, for example, Article 4 of the ECHR, which prohibits slavery, servitude, force and compulsory labour, as not only requiring positive obligations on states to criminalise each one of those elements, such as in the case of Siliadin in France in 2005, but also Rantsev in Cyprus in 2010 was able to move that along to say that human trafficking per se is to be uh, criminalised as well um, under the auspices of Article 4. And subsequent case laws such as Chowdhury um, and Greece uh, and the new case of SM and Croatia, etc., continually uh, develop the law that is then required to be implemented by the Council of Europe member states um, when respecting their legal obligations under Article 4. So um, I think there is a great advantage to a region having a supervisory jurisdiction of a court and even, for example, the ECOWAS system in uh, Eastern Africa was able to determine the Hadija II Mani case against Niger to outlaw the practice of uh, Wahia, which was the, um, um, the, the, the practice of having a fifth wife um, who was ultimately enslaved uh, in, in practice uh, because she was not one of the four legal wives under um, the law. So I think there needs to be a decision made by the Asia states as to how to go forward and hopefully, um, I mean I forever live in hope frankly and I think we have to um, hope that one day we can see political will to create that type of robust answer. Um, the question was asked about orphanage tourism and um, what I'd say about that is that it is extremely important to have awareness raising um, and certainly this uh, voluntourism where university graduates or gap year students go and work um, for an orphanage and think that they're doing good uh, needs to be much more cl closely um, treated with circumspect by the student themselves and by um, anyone who's going to put money into those orphanages some will be legitimate and there'll be no other opportunity for those children to be um, in a place of residential care. But others, as I say, um, are 
residential institutions that have been created for the purposes of financial exploitation. And so what we're finding and, and the work of Kate Van Dor in Australia has been pivotal here, which is that she has managed to persuade uh, and um, influence the Australian government to have a clause in its supply chains legislation that uh, requires a, a look at trafficking, um, orphanage trafficking as well. Um, but it's not a criminal law against orphanage trafficking yet. Uh, certainly in Britain as well, the work of LUMOS has been very pivotal. And for example, it's now in foreign, foreign and Commonwealth Office guidance that when going to particular countries, people should be aware before volunteering in orphanages that there might be a profile uh, of these kind of profit, uh, purely for profit, um, orphanages being um, ruses. So it's important to be aware where you're going and, and who you're putting your reputation and uh, name next to and who you're helping uh, acquire funds. Um, when it comes to the COVID question, I'd just like to deal with the immediate case that's sprung up in Britain in the last couple of days, which is the case of the um, workers in Leicester, a uh, city uh, in England, um, who it appears have been um, required to work during COVID for less than half the national minimum wage. Now this story is, has hit the headlines because in Britain we've suddenly got a local lockdown uh, in one area of um, the country, this, this city called Leicester. And when it's been looked into, it seems to have been precipitated by potentially migrant, not migrant workers, um, workers, British workers potentially, uh, being side by side in a close confine of uh, an industrial factory um, during COVID. Now, the reason why I bring this up in the modern slavery um, seminar, webinar, is because I think we need to be very careful about investigating the conditions of those workers, because it may not be just a straightforward health and safety issue, is what I'm saying. There may be something much more to it than that. Um, if, for example, there's been an abuse of their position of vulnerability to require them to come to work and put themselves at risk during the lockdown, um, then one would then want to look at the other ILO forced labour indicators to see if any have been met and that whether or not this is actually a case of forced labour, criminal offence, rather than a health and safety issue or an employment law issue. So um, I just wanted to raise that as a COVID-19 matter. Um, I will say myself that when I heard about spikes in, um, I think it was Singapore in a, that happened at one point, in Malaysia, I think at another point, um, the first thing I thought about is, was this spike coming from an area of dense migrant population? Well, not necessarily migrant, in those countries, there may be migrant workers, but in Britain, it's not necessarily migrant workers, but maybe domestic workers, um, domestic meaning British rather than uh, of another nationality. But are we finding a direct correlation at the moment in spikes and in modern slavery indicators? It's a question I think we need to look into. Um, and then coming on to the aspect of criminalization of victims of trafficking, particularly in the Asia region uh, concerning migrant workers and sex workers, this is an area of grave concern. Um, what we have is uh, the ASEAN convention there in black and white saying that there should be um, uh, protection from prosecution for those who commit unlawful acts. But what we really need to see is that those clauses imported into the domestic laws of any um, country, because it, it's, it's much easier for victims of trafficking and modern slavery to acquire the exercise of their rights if they can see it in the domestic law. But we need to persuade and have states understand and it's not a persuasion that has just a humanitarian aim, but a persuasion that has a very real outcome, is that in all of these cases where we criminalize a migrant worker 
who's been a victim of trafficking or a sex worker for the sex work when actually they're in a condition of sexual exploitation. The true perpetrator gets away and that is the person that has required them to perform their exploitation and the traffickers use all of the tricks whether it's illegal entry or uh, um, denunciation to the authorities threats of somebody might have already come into a country illegally and then they need a job and so traffickers use every single one of these vulnerabilities very well to suit their own ends and so by criminalizing the victims we simply enable the proliferation of trafficking to continue. I think those are the points I really wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. I can I can address some of the other questions as well, if that helps, um, Maria. Um, so you asked a question about the um, slap cases. Um, in Thailand, so the strategic litigation against public participation cases in Thailand and how this plays a role in justice for in relation to human trafficking and modern slavery. So those cases are very relevant to my work. Our partners have been affected by the strategic litigation um, in the Tamakasak case. In fact, it's, it's one of our partners that is or two of them that have been going to court. Um, and that have been charged under the criminal defamation laws in Thailand. Also some of the migrant workers that our partner was assisting, 14 migrant workers were also charged under that law. Um, and yeah, it's been used, um, you know, terribly by the Tamakaset um, owner uh, to try and, I guess, um, uh, to really um, deter um, civil society and migrant workers from taking legal action in relation to labour exploitation in their workplace. Um, it is having an effect because people have, have been charged under these laws and these cases have taken a long time to come to court and be resolved. Some of them have just been resolved recently, you might have seen, um, but um, the migrant workers involved were involved in these cases for, for years. Um, our partner that is still involved in some of these cases, it's not just one case, it's numerous cases brought against them under different laws. Um, journalists that tweeted about the case have been slapped with a charge and, and others involved as well. So, so it, is, it, it is definitely having an impact because people are, are, are more worried about taking legal action, but we're still proceeding with, with obviously with cases against um, employers um, as they arise. It's, it's uh, not deterring us from doing that, but um, you know, it is a factor that people take into account um, because they don't want to be involved in this, obviously. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess that's probably the best answer I could give at this stage. Um, in relation to COVID and how that's impacting or exacerbated vulnerabilities, it's it's having a huge impact, as I'm sure you've seen on, on all the news channels, like the scenes from India of all the migrant workers walking home. Um, in Thailand, the migrant workers that we work with um, in the fishing and seafood industry, whilst not all of them have lost their job because it's a food industry and people are still... Um, using a lot of food and the fishing industry was already under resourced so they still require labor a lot of them still have lost their wages or they've been um, they haven't been paid for months of their wages um, there's difficulty in returning home if they want to return home because the borders are closed they're not allowed to um, to use transport to go to the border and get home because tra trains and public transport have been stopped um, they're often, if they are still working, they might be in certain situations, they might be stuck in their workplace, which is really a problem for freedom of employment and movement. So they might be asked, for example, in the fishing situation, they might be asked to stay at the port overnight. So they get back to 
report from a fishing trip they have to stay there and then they get back on the next day so if they do have an issue that arose on the vessel they can't really access civil society support or other support because they're still in the confines of the port and similarly so that might happen in seafood processing factories where people are asked to stay on the compound or other types of industries as well so that has an impact um, and also there's been a lot of difficulty for migrant workers in accessing government support. So even though in, in certain countries and situations they have made uh, schemes available for migrant workers, uh, in reality they haven't been implemented properly or they require an employer to do something for a migrant worker to access something and the employer doesn't do that. They're in a different language to the migrant worker speaks and reads they are all online and they make it difficult for people to actually access um, there's just a range a range of things that made it difficult in india they started to distribute through the public distribution scheme which um, means that you have to be registered in your home state so if you're a migrant worker in tamil nadu and you're actually from jharkhand you have to go back to jharkhand to get your uh benefits um and be able to access them which was obviously really difficult when there's no trains operating or buses or things like that they have amended some of those things and realized uh, some of those flaws but um yeah the definitely definitely the pandemic is is really exacerbating vulnerability people have lost their jobs poverty um, is going to go up there's probably more like you know increased discrimination against migrant workers because um, they're in situations of employment where um, you know they're closer together and then when they return home there's discrimination against them as well um, yeah so it's 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 having a, a huge impact um, I think the United Nations think that I can't remember the number, I was just reading it the other day, but the number of people that are going to fall back into extreme poverty is, is huge. So, um, and the number of people that will be unemployed is huge. So it's going to have a terrible effect on the world's poorest and most vulnerable. Um, and then another question was to explain the lobbying process in the UPR. So the Universal Periodic Review um, is done for each country in the United Nations. It's a peer review. So what that is, is um, other countries in the United Nations review that country. So for Thailand, which is happening next year, there will be other countries that the United Nations will review Thailand's record of addressing human rights concerns. It happens periodically. So every, I think it's four years, I can't remember. But um, so Thailand's already had a review. And so this review will look at recommendations made to it in the previous review, what progress has been made and make new recommendations. The countries that recommend uh, recommendations to Thailand are not known till a bit closer to the review period. So we have to sort of figure out who those countries are that will be making, will be reviewing Thailand and try and um, advocate to those country governments to make recommendations to Thailand to address you know, uh, social security law. So not every uh, migrant worker in different sectors have access to social security to address their MOU procedures with different countries and make migration safer, to address problems with their labor inspection system, etc. those types of things um, we would be looking at. Um, so the process, it's usually better to lobby country governments um, that have embassies in Thailand. They're the ones that usually inform their counterparts in Geneva about what recommendations to make. Um, so that's the process that will be taken going forward. Um, yeah, and I, I, I don't think I heard the whole question on criminalization of victims, but as Parusha said, it's a huge issue and really needs to be looked into. Um, migrant workers and uh, sex workers are often criminalised in the process. In India, sex workers have been criminalised in the past. It's been terrible under the Immoral Trafficking in Persons Act. Um, it's now changed that they're not meant to criminalise the victims, but it still happens sometimes in practice. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a big issue and one that needs to be addressed. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank minute. you very much. Uh, we have thankfully, but uh, a lot more questions, but we don't have much time. And Parosha volunteered to address the question of um, so-called re-education camps in uh, Xinjiang. 
so maybe we can close the discussion with that one. I have uh, five more questions which uh, didn't make it, but I will perhaps liaise with you and we can address these questions in the final report that we produce. Uh, I hope you agree with that to make it within the time frame. Um, thank you, um, Maria. Um, I was actually, uh, I, I saw one of the questions was about organ um, uh, trafficking oh, organs. Sorry, yeah, actually there were two questions. One was about organ trafficking and then the other one was about re-education camps, but you want to address the organ trafficking. I think, I think there's only time to address one. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm just going to, um, hit the organ trafficking one running. So uh, one of the original forms of exploitation, the Palermo Protocol is of course, um, for the purpose of organ removal. Uh, and the significance of this is that the person is alive uh, and the organ is taken from them as a form of exploitation, i.e. to sell on. So it's a uh, distinction is that a person is not a, a donor or they haven't died already and the organ is taken. Um, the case of organ trafficking uh, in China has been growing in terms of the uh, understanding uh, internationally that Falun Gong um, practitioners who are prisoners um, by uh, serving sentences in prison in China, um, these are um, people who have a spiritual belief um, uh, uh, Called, it's called Falun Gong and, and they're considered to be a threat to the state because of their uh, independence from the state and their spiritual teachings um, have uh, been killed to order um, for their, their organs um, which are then removed from them uh, and sold on uh, and so um, what I can tell you very quickly, if you want to look into this, is that there was an independent tribunal set up in London that was called the China Tribunal and actually reached its findings uh, in the June of last year, so just the summer of 2019. Um, they heard hearings, it was an independent tribunal, it wasn't um, under any government uh, or and, and under any um, treaty um, it, and it's, it was said uh, that it, they found it that it was certain that Falun Gong uh, was princ a principal source of organs for forced organ harvesting. The, the language they used was organ harvesting but actually uh, the harvesting of an organ from a person who is alive for the purpose of financial use is actually the trafficking of a human being for purposes of organ removal and so I'm just explaining that um, and, and so if you want to look at the China Tribunal's findings um, from London in June 19, uh, 2019 um, I recommend you to do so. Um, that was a very quick answer. Yeah we do not have more time uh, but I will uh, contact speakers and we will make sure that all your questions, there were questions about organ trafficking, about the re-education camps about Asian domestic workers, global compact on migration, the Hindu caste system. So there are so many good questions that I'm sure our speakers can talk uh, at length about, but unfortunately there is no time. I would just uh, use this opportunity to thank both of them for an amazing uh, discussion and to invite, of course, all um, of our participants to join us uh, on the 9th of July for the second part of this event. And with that, I will just close the event. Thank you so much.